Welcome to Miners 12.3, where we are talking about Habakkuk, and we are talking about righteousness and faith today. Hit chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2 anyway. The beginning of chapter 2. God's response to Habakkuk's second question, when Habakkuk says, I'm going to sit here and wait and see you're going to respond to me. Thankfully, God does respond. He does respond. <laughs> Which is great news. Today, Aaron and I are joined by Lori Stotko. Hello, Lori. Hello. Would you just give a brief overview of who you are for those who may not know you? Sure. And what you do, because that's important for later. Okay. <laughs> um, I am an ordained minister. I'm a retired hospital chaplain, retired in 2019 when my husband and I, Steve, moved here to Orkut. Um, we've been attending Element for about two years, although we visited quite often when we visited family here. Um, we moved here from Mammoth, the Eastern Sierra, of about 30 years. Uh, we both lived in Mammoth. We both have sons in their 30s. Um, and currently, I'm a volunteer for Hospice of Slow County. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank we, you. I know part of your story, and so I, I, we thought it'd be really great to have you today uh, to explore more of your faith and thank how you, you came to, to know and trust Christ. Uh, but before we get there, Aaron, would you mind giving a brief recap of this message? So this week, we come to the third week of Habakkuk, and essentially this is the middle culmination of where the book's going to go. And this is the whole idea of faith. And there's a line that God says in Habakkuk 2.4 that the righteous will live by faith. This is something that goes all the way back to Abraham, where Abraham believed the Lord and it's credited to him as righteousness. And it goes through the Old Testament scriptures. You hit the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, that line there changes his entire life and how he views salvation. You go out from there all the way into the Reformation. The Reformation is set ablaze by Habakkuk 2.4, where Martin Luther comes to faith essentially because of this verse. And so everything we get to kind of culminates here in the third week. There's three more, don't worry, they're coming. But it kind of culminates here in this place of understanding that the righteous live not by our works, not by what we do, but by faith in Christ and what he has done for us. So two questions. Mm -hmm. What is righteous and righteousness and what is faith? Faith to me is what you actually said in the sermon is this deeper faith in who God is, yeah. what he is doing in my life, mm -hmm. even when I don't get it. And that, I think that really is the beauty of faith and, the, and righteousness. Our right relationship with God comes about because of that faith, really, that He's given us. But it's that faith that takes us there and God keeps us there. Mm -hmm. In the scriptures, we talked about this a few weeks ago, actually. Righteousness always has this idea of relationship. And it's being in a right relationship with someone. And when things are bad, you're not in right relationship because there's always this thing that stands in the way. Well, the things that stands in our way of relationship with God is our sin, obviously. And so it's always pulling us out of right relationship. Well, how can we live forever in right relationship with God? Well, it's by our sin being removed, but we can't do that ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we trust in Christ and that's how we live by faith. He brought us in by a work of himself and we are kept by a work of himself. So, so before putting faith in Christ, we, we as humans will often put our faith in other things yeah. to, to whether we can, we, and we can't, we can't put it in words like that. We yeah. can't put it in, I, I'm in not right standing with God. <laughs> but I think we all feel that way as humans, right? And so what things, maybe for you personally, before you put your faith in Christ, what type of things did you put your faith in to, to make you feel whole, to make you feel right? Um, music. I, I started playing music and I wanted, you know, that to make me feel good because once you do that and if you're good enough, people are like, oh wow, you're so great and then you feel good, you get the kudos and it's almost like you're in a right relationship because they're giving you this thing that you need. People do it with, with drugs, uh, you know, we do it, people do it with pets. No offense, cat ladies, but you know, there's some people get a million cats and it's like, oh, my cats love me. Your cats don't love you. Cats don't love anybody. You know, cats are just the worst. <laughs> well, and that's it exactly. It's putting, I think, um, the focus on us, our identity. So who I am, my job, what I do, my accomplishments, mm -hmm. people, uh, relationships. So uh, I would agree with what Aaron was saying. For you, so you mentioned music and relationships. So mm -hmm. how did those change over the next couple of decades as you? Well, I, I think in the end you, there's, there's kind of a, I, and I don't want, this sounds bad to say it this way, but there's, there's a settling into what I think 
God calls you to in your life. Because instead of this thing, God uses it in this direction. And instead of this thing that you're striving after, God uses it, uses it like this. And you, and you see how your relationships change. And yeah. you know, God points out in places where you're trying to get something out of this that that was never designed to do. Mm -hmm. And you're almost, you move from worshiping creation to worshiping the creator. Yeah. Yeah, because so often we, we take those things that are meant to be gifts to us to grow us towards him and we use them as trying to get our meaning from those things. And they're temporary. And they are all temporary. Yeah. So how about you, what, what, what was your journey like? What, like? what did you put your faith in and then how did you come to saving faith of, of trusting who God is and that he can make you righteous? Mm. Well, my life has been a complete 80 when I started to put my trust in him. Mm. I was raised in a religious home where I did everything right. Like a Protestant religious home or a yes. Catholic? Okay. Yes. Um, and I knew of God and about Him, but I really didn't know Him in relationship. Um, a few decades ago, I went through a divorce, stopped going to church, and started living with a boyfriend for 10 years. So here I was putting my um, trust and myself into the relationship like you just mentioned. Did you did you stop going to church because you felt disillusioned or because you weren't measuring up to God's righteousness or was there something there that made you leave to not be there to go do this thing? Um, I got very discouraged in my faith. Mm -hmm. I The marriage I went through, I then no longer believed in marriage anymore. Mm -hmm. Even though I was raised, well, it was, it was like my heart and my head did not align. I had these beliefs, but I, I think the bottom line, I was not in relationship with God. And then the relationship I got into, um, he was a non-believer hmm. that I lived with for 10 years. In 2006, I responded to a search and rescue call out to our community for a 19-year-old that was missing in a snowstorm. Unfortunately, she didn't live. Um, she was, her body was recovered uh, six days later. But what touched me was that they teamed me up with four people from her church family, and one was the pastor. Um, the whole time we were searching, they were just lifting up songs of praise and lifting her up in prayer. Um, and I thought, oh, I want that kind of love. I want that kind of support. And so they invited me to church. So I started attending immediately and didn't miss for about two years. But I was still living a life that wasn't honoring God. Mm -hmm. But because I wasn't living a life that was honoring God, I stopped going to church again. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years later, a nurse at the hospital where I worked invited me to a Bible study. And so I, I remember- I can't get away from these Christians. Uh, well, <laughs> I remember saying, I don't believe in doing those religious things. But it piqued my interest, so I was like, Okay, but what are you studying? Mm -hmm. So she said to me, we're reading The Purpose Driven Life. Okay. And so I thought, well, I've got that book. I'll just read it on my own. I think everybody has that book at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll check in with you every now and then just to see what you're talking about. So I started my journey immediately getting up early every morning mm -hmm. and reading The Purpose Driven Life. So this 40 day journey, I got to the end of it and I was enjoying that book so much, I was sad that it was over. So I decided to read again. Mm -hmm. So my 80 day journey became, my 40 day journey became an 80 day journey, but the next 40 days were so different than the first 40 as I was falling in love with Jesus like never before because I was spending this intimate time with him. Mm -hmm. And my life started to transform so much that I decided to move out from that relationship and not live with that boyfriend. And then I ended up rededicating my life to the Lord mm -hmm. and started attending church again. And now my community saw this change, this transformation. And so now my community was coming up to me saying, I want what you have. You're glowing, you're radiant. And it gave me a great opportunity to um, share God with them. Mm -hmm. Now, during this time, I felt a call into ministry. And I remember questioning God, you know, like, really? Because now... Have you I'm, seen the mess of my life? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And now I'm, at that point, I was in my early 50s, and mm. I'm thinking, oh, I'm gonna have a career change now. Um, and I remember he kept putting on my heart 
um, I am in this, do you trust me? I am in this, do you trust me? And I remember thinking, yes, I actually do, Lord. And so I felt a call to go back to school, even though I was still working full time at the hospital. I decided to go back to school and study spiritual direction and um, hospital chaplaincy. Okay. This is where God stepped in with that faith that I didn't know what he was doing, but I was just trusting him. He softened hearts and opened doors to the point that the hospital approached me to develop a spiritual care program. Mm -hmm. And it became a such high demand, not just with the patients and families, but spiritual counseling for the staff, um, where it became my full-time job. Mm -hmm. So then I became the manager of spiritual care and um, the hospital chaplain. Now, fast forward seven years later, from this incident with the 19-year-old girl. Um, it's now 2013, and God puts on my heart to pray for that dad of the missing 19-year-old. Had I, you ever met him before? I had met him, um, but I hadn't talked to him in seven years, eight, mm -hmm. uh, six years since that incident. So um, I started praying for him, and within a few months, he came and visited the church that I was greeting that weekend, and we reconnected. One year later, we married. <laughs> that dad is my husband, Steve. That's crazy. Isn't that? And yeah. so to me, it just, I look back over my life and I see these situations or circumstances as gifts of grace, gifts of grace from a deep faith in who he is, mm -hmm. what he's done in my life, and not even when I don't get it. So you mentioned your community and how they saw a difference in you. How do you how do you communicate when with those at work or when they were in the hospital and and or just your friends and family who needs to hear that message of grace and and that that God is good enough. I believe as scripture says, nothing is impossible for God. And thank goodness, his ways and thoughts are higher than mine because he's taking me places I would have never imagined. And I compare it to, as a parent, I want the best, absolute best for my child. God is the same. He's my father. He wants the best for his children. And so I trust him completely. And when I take my eyes off of him and they're on me, um, that's when you, get into I get into the you know trusting what's temporary right in front of me but if I can keep my gaze fixed on him um, seeing through his eyes the eyes of his heart his perspective it's at a much deeper spiritual um, awareness I can see things more clearer he never leaves me I have left him as I shared in my story so we never leave him I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we leave him. He never he leaves, leaves us. We never leave him. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he never leaves us. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. So I appreciate that you brought up pride. So in the, in the handouts, the, the question revolves around where do you take pride in your achievements? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second part of it is, is how is living by faith alone so difficult and not, not trying to be boastful or think that it's your works that bring salvation but why is it so so difficult to live by by faith alone it's hard to live by faith because we have to trust christ for our righteousness and not something we do and that's why people become religious because they want yeah. to do something on their own there it can't be true that there's nothing i can do and there is nothing we can do you know, Martin Luther in his story, you know, just, just going up those steps on his knees and just coming to the place where God's like, hey, buddy, okay, this isn't what I'm calling you to do. I'm calling you to trust me. And he gets up and walks back in. What's the difference in his life? He starts nailing theses to doors and causing problems in the Catholic Church and just, you know, going all crazy. And But you see the difference in, in his life as soon as God gets a hold of him and he realizes this is not how I obtain righteousness. With that, uh, there is good news that, that we can be made righteous. We can be put back in right standing with our good and gracious creator. And thankfully, it is not our work. It is all Christ's work for us on our behalf. And we get to live by faith that, that he is who he says he is, that we are who we, he says we are, but that we can be bought back from the slavery that we are in and made right and whole with our good and gracious God. And so as you 
go about your day, keep that in the forefront of your mind that you are adopted. And if, if you haven't put your faith into him yet, uh, please reach out. We will we would be happy to help walk you through what it means to put that faith into him for the first time and grow in love. And uh, if you have, think of those who need to hear that message uh, around you. And with that, we'll see you next week for Habakkuk part four. Part four. This is a great story. <laughs> wow. Okay. It gets better. It gets okay. better.